just to remind you a little bit about the church at Corinth, Paul spent a year and a half, the longest he spent at any one place, starting a church in the city of Corinth, that Greek city. And after it was grounded, he returned to his home base of Antioch, and a few months later, he began his third missionary journey. And when he arrived in Ephesus, he heard of trouble in the church in Corinth. And so from Ephesus, he wrote his first letter, 1 Corinthians, to the church in Corinth, and it was delivered through his friend and co-worker, Titus. Now, before we go any further, I've known a lot of churches over the uh, nearly 50 years now I've been in ministry, and uh, I've known a lot of churches historically all the way back to the first church on the day of Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem. I have never known a church as dysfunctional and messed up as the church at Corinth. When Paul wrote the first, however bad you ever think you've ever seen a church problem, it is not comparable to the church at Corinth when Paul wrote his first letter there. And the reason that he wrote the first letter, even after having only been gone for a little while, is because they had, they had really just collapsed into almost complete disunity. So he started the book, and the first two chapters are about unity. And some of you, he said, are saying uh, you are of Paul. Some say you are of Cephas. Some of you say you are of Apollos or somebody else, and you're all divided. And I, You're all supposed to be just of Christ, not of any of us. And, and then he went from the, the disunity and the division they had on to just crazy stuff going in the, on in that church. They were, there was a situation in chapter 5 where he addressed a man who was having a sexual affair with his mother-in-law. And the church was not only accepting it, they were glorifying about it. Can you imagine that? They were glorifying about it. And so he addressed that, and, and he told them to just withdraw from the man completely and do the right thing and follow God's Word and God's will. And then, then in chapter 6, he talked about them uh, suing each other. They were suing each other nonstop in public courts. They weren't going to their elders or to one another. They were suing each other. And he went on and on with the problems between men and women, problems with the Lord's Supper. They were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. I've heard of a lot of problems of church in the last 50 years while I've been preaching. I've never heard of any church where they were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. Not a single one. But they were in Corinth. And he, they were messing up spiritual gifts. They were claiming the wrong gifts. That's a series right before this one that I did, the chapter on love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The reason he wrote about love being the greatest gift of all is because chapters 11 and 12 are about how they were messing up the spiritual gifts God had given them. Chapter 14, their church assemblies were a wreck. They were a train wreck, literally. And out of chapter 14 comes some of the controversial, controversial verses in Corinth. Of course, Timothy also uh, had uh, First Timothy, Paul wrote them to Timothy about women's role in the church. So I, all I'm saying is, to sum it up, Corinth was an absolute mess. And Paul's letter got a mixed reaction. Some of the Corinthians, including the man having the affair with his mother-in-law, repented. They responded with what Paul called a godly sorrow, that led to change. But other of the Corinthians resented Paul, and they said, who does he think he is? Who is this guy? I mean, why should we have to listen to him? And the implication of the second letter is more of them resented him than repented because of his teaching. In fact, Detractors in the church at Corinth began to even question his authority. Well, he wasn't one of the original apostles. And they began to cast doubt on his integrity and his honesty and even his courage. So in his case, absence didn't make the heart grow fonder. News of the reaction to his first letter to the church at Corinth came to Paul while he was in Macedonia on the third missionary journey. And so he penned a second letter to them. 
That's what we've got before us now, 2 Corinthians. And in this letter, it's very practical, has a lot of things that deals even with the church today. In this letter, he boldly defends himself and his ministry. He confronts his accusers. 2 Corinthians is a raw, emotionally charged letter where Paul shares his heart and pleads his conscience as he does really nowhere else. And so that makes 2 Corinthians a pretty good primer for everyone who wants to be involved in a church because serving God isn't always hassle-free fun. And the reason is, hurt people hurt people. It's usually hurt people who lash out and hurt other people. And so the first thing, if loving Christians, we ought to ever do when somebody is, is attacking somebody else is wonder what is going on in their life. And that's not the first thing we usually do. The first thing we usually do is attack back or keep distance. We usually do one of the other, one of the other extreme. We usually attack back or we keep our distance as far away from them as we can do so. But 2 Corinthians is really a pretty good proof that hurt people hurt people. And so the first couple of three chapters in particular is going to emphasize how a, a good heart and a caring attitude is really needed in ministry, but there is a right and wrong way to attempt to rescue spiritually drowning people. We're going to see that. Did you ever hear the story about the New Yorker who was driving through Texas when he suffered a collision with a truck pulling a horse trailer. And a few months later, after he'd filed insurance to collect insurance money for his injuries, the insurance company lawyer contacted him and said, wait, wait, wait a minute. How, you didn't claim you were injured back at the accident and the accident report with the police. How can you claim now you were injured? And the New Yorker said, well, here is what really happened. I was lying in the ditch in a great deal of pain. I heard someone say that a couple of the horses had broken legs. And I watched as the state trooper pulled out his gun and shot both those horses. And then he came over to me and asked, how you doing? And I just smiled and said, I'm fine. That's what most Christians do when they are asked, how are you doing? It happens in here every single Sunday to me. So I'm certain it happens to you where people will say, being nice on Sunday, hey, how you doing? And you immediately say, fine, great, how are you? When chances are you've spent much of that week not being fine, not doing great. And you just don't say. We're no different from the New Yorker. And one of the reasons for that is because many Christians still embrace the faulty idea of the Jews. All the way back to Genesis, that believers should never suffer. And if we do suffer, it's because we've done something wrong and God is punishing us. And as we open the pages of 2 Corinthians, we're going to discover that even committed Christians go through very tough times of suffering. Just a word about Corinth again before we move on into the text. Corinth was the third largest city in the entire Roman Empire. Rome was number one. Alexandria was number two. But Corinth was different even from Rome and Alexandria because it was a port city known for unbelievable wickedness and promiscuity. The temple of Aphrodite, also called Venus, was there. It was in Corinth, and Paul addressed this in the first letter, that temple prostitutes offered sex as a devotion to the goddess Aphrodite. Corinth was sex and pleasure crazy. It was also sports crazy. It was the entertainment capital of the Roman Empire. Many people in the Roman Empire 
went to Corinth when they wanted to gamble on games, whether it was the ancient Olympic games or the Isthmus games, which wasn't far away from Corinth, and that happened a lot. So it's a little bit like Corinth was modern Las Vegas with all the sex, pleasure, and gambling on sports except on steroids. That's what Corinth was like. Does it sound maybe a little bit familiar? When you compare the culture of Corinth with ours, it's easy to see where maybe we have developed a little bit of a Corinthian culture in America. And this letter, 2 Corinthians, could be addressed to us because just like those early Christians in the first century, we are called upon to share a countercultural message with a culture that doesn't really want to hear it. It's interested in pleasure and sports and entertainment. And so, the first few verses, Paul is going to begin his letter by writing about this subject of comfort. Hmm. And as we begin, we're going to read it in the NLT. I want you to count how many times the word comfort is used. And if you're using, if you have your Bible with you or using your, your device and you're in the NIV, you, you, I want you to particularly count the number of times the word comfort is used. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. Right off the start, you see what he's saying there. Some of you are saying, who's this guy? What, why him? Well, I've been chosen by the will of God to be an apostle. And he'll show a defense for that later. I'm writing to God's church in Corinth and to all of his holy people throughout Greece May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and is the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. All right, how many comforts here? If you're reading in the NIV, it's 10. 10. So in five verses, because they didn't start till verse 3. So verses 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, somewhere between 9 and 11 times the word comfort is used. Do you think maybe he's trying to tell us something? So let me ask you as I start tonight, are you comfortable? Make it into two words now. Are you comfortable? Now I'm not talking about are you comfortable as you sit in those pews. We've made them as comfortable for you as we possibly can. You could even lay down if you want to on Wednesday night. I wouldn't do that on Sunday morning. But you can even lay down if you want to on Wednesday night. If you're sitting at home watching, and a lot of people do, they're probably very comfortable in their lazy boy chair or laying on their sofa. But I'm not asking you if you feel relaxed. It's a difference, say, relax and comfort. As you sit there in a padded pew or as you watch on a soft recliner. What I mean is, are you able to allow God's comfort to comfort you when you are in pain, trouble, or suffering? Or do you just keep on complaining and complaining and complaining? And I'm also asking you this. Are you able to comfort others when they are hurting? Because he made this crystal clear. The purpose of God comforting you is not just to make you feel good and relaxed. It's for you to learn then how to comfort others. So we pass it on. 
we pass it on. In verse 3, we're given some insight, I think, into God's nature when Paul wrote, Praise be to the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Let's don't go any further than that before we pull over and part for just a second. I've often said from this pulpit that believing God exists is just the first step in faith. You can believe that God exists, but if you believe in the wrong kind of God that exists, that can do you more harm than good. It really can. That could be worse than being an atheist. The Bible gives dozens of simple declarative statements describing God's character. For instance, he is the great I am. He is holy. He is love. He is spirit. He is light. God is love. There's many more. But here it says he is the God of all comfort. And based on what the word actually means in the original language, that means he is the God who sees my pain and feels my pain and cares about my pain. And he said it nine times in five verses. Nine times in five verses. Now let me tell you why that's so significant to the people who were reading this letter in the first century. Remember, This is in the Roman Empire and in a Greek culture. The Greeks had lots of gods, but they knew absolutely nothing, zero, about this kind of God. Greek gods and goddesses threw thunderbolts down from heaven and inflicted curses on people. And they did everything they could to keep from offending their Greek gods. The Greek gods specialized in making life very, very hard on anybody who crossed them. Natural disasters or calamitous events that happened in that day and time under the Greek gods were considered the gods punishing them in some way. No doubt about it. And you served and sacrificed to these gods, not out of love, but out of fear and to pacify them, to keep them off your back and to get them out of your life, not into your life. And so here comes Christianity, different from anything the world has ever seen or heard of, describing nine times in five verses a God of all comfort who sees your pain, feels your pain, cares about your pain. What a surprise to these newly converted Corinthian Christians who had come out of a Greek God culture to hear that the true God is a God of mercy and comfort. I bet they just couldn't believe it. Wow, you're saying we now serve a God we don't have to fear? A God we can trust to pick us up, not to put us down? A God that loves us, not going to strike us with some sort of natural disaster or calamity? That's right. Isaiah 66 says, This is what the Lord says, I will give Jerusalem a river of peace and prosperity. The wealth of the nations will flow to her. Her children will be nursed at her breast, carried in her arms and held on her lap. I will comfort you there in Jerusalem as a mother comforts her child. Now understand, these new Corinthian Christians are now studying the only thing they have. The New Testament's not finished, so they're studying the Old Testament. And the Jewish Christians that are teaching them, including Paul and Titus and Timothy and others, are reading to them and sharing to them about the nature of the true God from the Old Testament. And that God is one who comforts you as a mother comforts her child. You remember when you were a child and you fell and you cut your knee And it hurt, 
and you were so scared. It was just a little scratch, but there was a little blood running down your leg, and you didn't like blood, and you were just certain they were going to have to amputate your leg. And you went running in to mom screaming, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. And she grabbed you at the door and took you in your arms and carried you in lovingly and washed your scratch and cleaned it and kissed you where it hurt. I still do it all the time with my three youngest grandsons. Kissed you where it hurt and said, Now, now, everything is going to be all right. The Bible says God comforts us like that. God comforts us just like a mother. Are you hurting in any way? Close your eyes and picture yourself running to God like the prodigal son and saying, Daddy, I need you. That's a perfectly biblical illustration. And the father, like with the prodigal son, runs to you and embraces you. And he doesn't say, I told you so. What were you doing out there running around? No. Just like he didn't say to the prodigal son, I told you so. You should have never left home and lived, spent all your inheritance on wine, women, and song. I, no. He went running to the son who wanted to come home as a slave and a servant. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. Bring, the, bring the, my finest robe. Bring the fatted calf. Let's throw a party. Now, I don't, I don't want you to just listen and forget this truth tonight. Because this is one powerful truth. That God is the God of all comfort. That God is not some import, impersonal force who is neither uncaring or unable to know you and care about you. The gods in Greek and Roman mythology were too busy with their own lives to be concerned about humans. But the God of the Bible, the God of all comfort, is interested in every detail of my life. Another verse says, see, I've written your name on the palms of my hand. Always in my mind is a picture of Jerusalem's walls in ruins. Our names are written on the palm. Is, by the way, this scripture says that at least three times that I'm aware of. Or I traded, Isaiah 43, 4 says, their lives for yours because you are so precious to me. You are honored and I love you. God is the God of all comfort. Now, I didn't ask you to read this when we were reading through the, those five verses, but the second most common word in that passage is the word, and you count it either way, trouble or suffered, suffering, trouble or suffering. And that's listed six times. Six times the word trouble or suffering is used. You see, our modern use of the word comfort has robbed it of a lot of its true strength. To us, comfort is a soft, smooth, sentimental feeling. We use it to, dis, you know, to describe a soft, fluffy covering for a bed. We even call it a comforter. <laughs> and comfort in today's culture is such a soothing, quiet word that I hesitate to even use it in the biblical context because it's nothing like what Paul is talking about here in 2 Corinthians. It is an action word in 2 Corinthians. It is an action word. The word comfort is the action word parakaleo. You see it right there as part of the... As, sometimes it's used to be as the encourager. Sometimes it's used as comfort. Here, of course, in 2 Corinthians, it's used as the word comfort. Does that word come to mind to any of you Bible students? Any of you Bible students who remember over in John chapter 14 during Jesus' five-chapter discourse to his disciples the night that he was going to be arrested and just before he was going to go to the cross in the upper room when he said to his disciples, when I leave you, I'm going to send you a comforter. That's the same word. That's the word that Jesus used in John chapter 14, parakaleo. I'm going to send you a comforter. Listen, 
that's not a nice, um, um, not sheet, but nice cover on a bed. <laughs> Paracaleo is not a comforter on your bed. Not hardly. So we got to think about what this word means. Well, it was the word used to describe, of all things, the Holy Spirit of God. And as we really live for God every day, the Holy Spirit paracaleos us, us. Our English word comfort comes from a combination of two words that means with strength. The fort in comfort reminds us of the word fortify or fortitude. So comfort means with strength fortifying you, literally. That's what the English word means. Let me, get, let me give you a visual definition of that, if I may. Imagine an elderly man or woman standing at the bottom of the set of stairs, and they've got to climb a steep set of stairs, kind of like our baptistry in here. I don't know how many of you have ever climbed. These are the hardest stairs to climb in the history of mankind in our baptistry back here. I do not know how the city the city, the code, coding department of the city were literally hell on us, except for this one area. And how they let us get by with having a non-wheelchair accessible, uh, I, I, and then one that you've got to be pretty healthy to get up there. So let's picture somebody back here, and if you had never been there, go back there and see it sometime. Uh, an older man or woman who's got problems with their knees and their ankles or their hips and they're, and they're looking up and they're going to try to go up there and they're thinking, can I make it? Can I make it? And you're standing off to the side saying, I'll go ahead. The worst that can happen is you'll fall. Uh, go ahead and try it. Never know if you'll make it until you do it. Or you go over, you grab them from both sides one step at a time you help them walk up those stairs and come alongside them physically with your strength to help them and encouraging, paracaleoing them. You got that picture? Because that's what God does when he comforts us in our troubles. He doesn't just call down from heaven and say, hey, use the handrail. Good luck down there, Randy. I hope that you've got that bum knee right now. I hope you don't fall. No, he comes alongside to comfort you and to help you. It reminds me of the young mother who once wrote, it was one of the worst days of my life. The washing machine broke down. The telephone kept ringing. My head was aching. The mail carrier brought a bill. I had no money to pay. Almost to the breaking point, I lifted my one-year-old into her high chair leaned my head against the tray and began to cry. And without a word, my one-year-old daughter took her pacifier out of her mouth and stuck it into mine. <laughs> oh. She's trying to comfort mommy. Hey, I know people who like to share pacifiers. They get together all the time to nurse wounds and cry over a little spilt milk. They grumble about how hard they've got it, but that's not the comfort God is talking about or specializes in. His comfort is more than a pacifier. He gives you the strength to rise up in his spirit and tackle the challenges you face. He comforts us like I used to comfort my little leaguers when they would go up to bat, and the hardest thing that a little leaguer, the hardest thing that a kid who's six, seven, eight, nine years old ever has to do is to think about and then actually have it happen, get hit by the ball, get hit by a pitch ball. But you're going to, if you play baseball long enough, my grandson Taylor, when he first started playing, I told him that the thing that's going to determine whether you're going to be able to stay in there and hit or not is when you get hit, the first time you get hit, because it's going to hurt. It's called hard ball for a reason. And when you get hit now, you've got to get right back in there and you've got to stay with your mechanics properly the right way. And so I, I would teach the little leaguers, you know, when you get hit, I would go out to him and I'd say, all right, I'd rub a little. and I'd say, You're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. That's okay. That's about 30 seconds of that. Now get to first base. You've earned a base. Play. Enjoy. Run. Don't give up. Don't give in. So 
you know, there's no crying in baseball. I saw that in a movie. My high school football coach was mean. In my whole high school career, he had a team rule. If you were seriously injured, well, one year he actually had a rule he didn't want to come on the field the entire year for an injured player. That's truth. But the next year, he changed it a little. If you were seriously injured, you were supposed to stay on the ground, don't move a muscle, and somebody would come on the field and assist you to the sidelines. But if you just got the breath knocked out of you, or you pulled up with a cramp, or you got tired, he said, you get yourself off the field. I saw our all-state quarterback, David Schaub, one time, roll 10 yards. Am I making that up? You were there. Roll 10 yards off the field. Our best player. Because, as Coach Dozier put it, I don't want anybody clapping for you just because you got hurt. Sometimes Christians think they need to be clapped for and need applause just because they're hurting or are injured. That's not helpful. Understand, Jesus does comfort us, but it's comfort that refortifies us for victory. He refuses to affirm and assign permanent disability to anybody. Nowhere in Scripture does Jesus say, you can be spiritually retired, you've had enough hurt, that's it for you. He heals the hurting heart in order to get us back into action. Sometimes Christians are so self-centered that they remind me about the story of a guy named Sam who was taking a first aid class. And Sam, the next week in the class, say, last week I got the chance to apply what I learned in class. The instructor said, oh, that's great. Tell us about it, Sam. And he said, a few days ago I heard a terrible crash. Just across the street from my house, when I went outside, I saw that a car had veered off the road and plowed head on to a big tree in my yard. There were injured passengers hanging out the door. And because I had taken this class, I knew exactly what to do. I immediately sat down on my steps and put my head between my knees so I wouldn't pass out. Sadly, that's how many Christians feel about their faith. To them, church is coming and sitting and soaking it in and then leave, and just whatever they've learned is used to make them more comfortable. But God comforts us for the purpose, the text says, of us learning how to comfort others. God's comfort does not terminate in the one who receives it. It's not supposed to terminate. It's supposed to be carried and passed on. Here's a provocative quote that I ran across. If you're going to be used by God, he will take you through a multitude of experiences that are not meant for you at all. They are meant to make you useful in his hands. I had to think a long time about that, and I still have to think a lot about that theologically, and I first rejected it, honestly. I first rejected it theologically. But then I thought back to Jesus, and I thought to the disciples, and I thought to the early church experience, and I thought, I, I think that may be right. That some of the things we go through, that we then trust God in faith, and he rescues us, and he allows us to get stronger, and then we go on and share it to others that were meant to be useful in our hands. Hey, that might be true. Because God does not make us comfortable. In order to be comfortable, he makes us and gives us comfort to make us comforters. Empathy is one of the most powerful forces on earth. The knowledge that somebody knows and somebody cares, it's a big deal. But a person with empathy pays a price to obtain it. The tendency for us when we get hurt is to shut down and to lick our wounds and to sit on the sidelines and to sulk in our sadness. But healing only comes to us when we keep on caring and loving and reaching out to others because 
all of God's true healers are wounded healers. We learn how to help people because we've been there ourselves. I cannot tell you how many times I have gone through something that I have thought, why am I feeling this? Why am I experiencing this? Heart surgery, depression, whatever it may be. Why am I going through this? And then I learn later why. Oh, I can help this person with this, this person with this, this person with this. I love the following poem. Oops. Until I learned to trust, I never learned to pray. I never learned to fully trust till sorrows came my way. Until I felt my weakness, my strength I never knew, nor dreamed till I was stricken that someone would see me through. Who deepest drinks of sorrow drinks deepest too of grace. What a great line of prose. Who deepest drinks of sorrow drinks deepest too of grace. You brave the storms and face it so you can be your hiding place. Our hearts seek our highest good, knows well when things annoy. We would not long for company if loneliness held joy. God comforts us because he loves us, and then so we can comfort others.